So the noise machine, the search for differentiating a signal of T to TH from a background of TT bar by me, Grant Gallier. So what have I been doing? I started out learning a CERN's root data analysis framework, um, then plotting different variables such as PTHT and ADA using um, data from the CMS experiment. And we've been looking specifically at the production of a hypothetical T quark. Um, it poses a potential solution to the hierarchy problem. And then using these plots to differentiate between this signal we're looking for and um, background signal. And then so you want to maximize that ratio of signal to background. And kind of on the side, I was writing some scripts to help make pretty plots. Um, so a quick review, the standard model, it's the um, currently widely accepted theory. It um, describes the electromagnetic and the weak and strong nuclear interactions, and it classifies uh, the subatomic particles. It doesn't explain gravity, um, dark matter, and dark energy, and the neutrino masses. And then, so I mentioned the hierarchy problem earlier. So what is this? One part of it is that the uh, weak force is 32 times stronger than gravity, and so we, it's kind of like that, uh, I mean, hierarchy issue, that difference, uh, extreme difference there. The Higgs mass is kind of disproportional. And so the search for the hypothetical T offers these solutions. It's a heavier cousin to the uh, top quark. Um, and so it will help to regu regu regularize the um, Higgs mass and that big jump. And so I said I got information from the uh, CMS detector. So what is it? The CMS detector, CMS stands for Compact Neon Solenoid. It's an experiment at uh, the LHC, and it has like five main parts. Um, in the center, there's the tracker, which uh, sees the path of the muons, electrons, and hadrons. So you can see where they go. And then the next um, layer is the ECAL, the electromagnetic calorimeter which stops um, photons and electrons and measures their energies. So that's how I get that information. And after that is the hadron calorimeter, HCal, which stops the hadron so we can get their energies there. And then after that is the superconducting solenoid magnet, which so that bends the paths of the um, uh, charged particles. And by how much those paths bend, we can see the momentum that those particles have. And so that's a mix between it, it bends them, and then you also look in the tracker because you can see the paths and how they curved. And then after that, finally, we have the muon detector, which, because muons pretty much get through everything, we assume that anything that's making it through all that iron and other material, at that point, is pretty much a muon. And so yeah, anything that's making it out that far, it's pretty much just a last dip, ditch effort to detect them. So I mentioned some variables earlier. So in the detector, we describe the beam direction as the Z direction. Horizontal, or like it would be coming out of the screen in this picture is X, and then Y is vertical. And then, so for angles, we have phi, which is in the X, Y plane, and then theta, which is the angle with respect to the Z axis. But um, to kind of standardize theta, um, we, we use what's called eta, which is described by this function, the negative natural log of the tangent of theta over two. And so what that does is it normalizes theta so you get an evener, more even distribution. It also doesn't change with reference frames. And so PT is the transverse momentum, which is all momentum that is going, that is orthogonal to the beam direction. And then HT is the sum of all those transverse momenta with a little bit of criteria. And this is just a graph of the um, of eta with, uh, as a function of theta. It just kind of helped me see like what that function is actually doing. And so earlier on, I had a picture of what's called a Feynman diagram. And so what these do are they're visual representations of these decay processes. So it helps to understand what's going on without having to look at an otherwise extremely complex mathematical equation. And so like here, 
this is for the, these are both for the background, or one of the background processes of it. So this is glue on, glue on to TT bar, and then TT bar out uh, to W plus, W minus, and bottoms and other stuff. Um, so these are helpful descriptions to see what's going on. Um, yeah. So how do you come up with these differentiations? So first we look at the plot of those aforementioned variables and you can see where they spike and depending on the different um, masses and then also you compare that to your background processes. So you try and find places where there's different spikes in different places. Um, and then so you kind of just decide on these cuts to maximize this function which is number of signal events over the square root of the number of background events times the scale factor. Um, and so that scale factor comes from the fact that the specific process we're looking at does not necessarily happen 100% of the time. And so you have to scale your events based on the percent chance of it happening and also by the number of events you're looking at compared, uh, background events compared to signal. And so basically you kind of just maximize this based on trial and error, throw in some cuts and see what happens. So I ended up with this slew of cuts and yeah, for the whole event, because HT is kind of a whole event thing, greater than um, 1,100 GeV, and then some cuts on specific particles. And then depending on the mass, you can see that it's more efficient with some masses compared to others. Uh, the lower masses, because they have lower momentum, get cut out by some of these higher energy cuts. And I'm working on getting a percent difference of how what this improvement is compared to what it would be without the cuts that I implemented. But yeah, I couldn't get that done for today. And so the other thing I was doing was these, this adventure for these pretty plots. So I'm looking for getting, so you, we were making these two-dimensional plots. And it's really helpful if you can have the um, one-dimensional components on either side flipped and scaled correctly. So you can see what's going on both in the one-dimensional and then combined in this two-dimensional. But I ran into some issues along the way with things like um, root doesn't let you plot history in sideways. You end up with something like this where it's just both of them are vertical, which doesn't quite work out. Completely corrupted image files like this. Um, don't really know why. Low quality y-axis histograms. What would happen is the histogram on the y-axis, even after you had flipped it, ends up being all uh, blurry and pixelated. And then the final and most annoying issue was the image would be scaled and it would be either super zoomed in or like 10 by 10 pixels and you just couldn't tell what was going on. So the strange solution I found was you turn the y-axis histogram into an image, rotate that image by 90 degrees, some mathing estimation to get it to line up so you can see what's going on. And then finally, that fixes all the issues except the scaling. And I couldn't figure out, I was reading source code and different things, diving really deep to figure out what was going on. Turns out, this fixes it. Draw XXX, triple X, and it expands the image to fill the size and works. So, yeah. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Can you just explain what the scale factor does and why it's used? Okay, so you have to scale it because um, the specific decay mode and other things we're looking at are not necessarily guaranteed to happen 100% of the time. We're looking at something that only happens some percent of the time. And so you have to calculate the probability and add that into your uh, efficiency, basically. So you have to account for it's not always happening. Do you know offhand what version of Ruby you're using? 6.06. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some of that might be quirks of 3.6. And that question because it takes triple X something? No, it's just a lot of things change with Ruby 6. You guys are using older? Um, I use a, like a newer build of Ruby 6. Okay. And then also I know Ruby 5 works a little bit smoother.